Hello, friends. Welcome back to the Gut Connection Seminars. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to, uh, to have you here. I hope you've been already learning a few things, easy things to implement, and there are more to come. Now, in, the, uh, in this presentation, we have the gut in a slow motion. And the New Footsteps lecture series are designed to share available information with the general public. They are not to be used as a treatment for individual cases. For online appointments, visit our website, newfootsteps.com.au. All right, that's us. That's our website. That's what you will see when you uh, find us on, on the internet. I like that photo. You like that photo? Now, my, grand, my great grandfather was an alcoholic. My grandfather, now I never met my great grandfather, but he was an alcoholic. But I didn't meet my grandfather. He was an alcoholic. I remember my grandfather, we would go and see him. He was my father's father. We were going to see him once, once a year, just for about 10 days or so, 10, 15 days. And what I remember of him was a man that he was sleeping next, next door to our bedroom, and you will hear a lot of snoring and a lot of coughing. And in the morning, you will hear him coming downstairs. <coughs> right, just like that. And then he will go into a little cellar that he, he had there, and he will put this very thick red wine, thick, like, uh, like yogurt, but in red, and it was wine, you know, very thick. And he will come and, uh, 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 and he sit down there, and he will drink it. Just a nice big breakfast bowl like that. No breakfast, no cereals, just that. And then about two hours later, when everybody wanted to inquire where was Grandpa, Grandpa somehow had found its way like this uh, 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 to the two and a half kilometers pub or tavern that was there, and he would get there. You'll think, you'll see him, and you say, that guy is going to die tomorrow. Well, he will get to the pub, you know, and then he will just continue to drink wine all through the day, and then he will get somebody to, that will give him a lift back home. Back in the house, my auntie will actually make maybe like a, we call it a French omelette, you know, a couple of eggs, and he will give him that, and then he will get up, <coughs> will get his nice bowl of red wine, and will drink it. That's the memory that I've got of him, always, always like that. It was so good because he will give us $50 to me and my brother a number of times because he keep on for, kept on forgetting that he had already given, given us money. He was so drunk, he kept on forgetting that, that he gave us already the money. So my brother and I, we were not going to say anything. You know, we'll keep the $50 and then we'll put another $50 in. Uh, so interesting, his father was an alcoholic and he was an alcoholic. My grandmother always pleaded with him because he was abusive and he was always pleaded with him to actually leave alcohol. When my grandmother died, he decided to actually quit out alcohol to honor her about time. I mean, now she's dead and now he goes and quit alcohol. So rather than actually the wine, he transferred the wine and he started drinking a lot of orange juice from the, from the can or from the carton. And he actually died six months after. I always thought, you know, that the orange juice killed him, you know? <laughs> uh, because he died at the age of 86. Wow. Now, my father will not go out of the house without putting in his coffee a little bit of brandy, or we call it uh, aguardiente, which is like burning water, which is a very alcoholic made out of, out of grapes, out of the seed of the grapes, very, very strong alcohol, alcohol content. And, and he will be having his third or fourth gin and tonic by one o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, had a lot of insecurities. He will go to business deals and he will just have a whiskey just before he will walk in because he will give him the stamina, okay? So I really doubt that my father is going to get to 86. I really doubt it. He is having a very inflamed liver already. My, father, my grandfather, by the way, he had a bleeding liver, okay? Probably the, the, such a large amount of orange juice didn't help anyhow, okay? But he did have an issue with the liver. My father's liver 
is already inflamed. He has a lot of issues with his metabolism. He has already the thyroid being removed, has so many issues, allergies now that he's having that he never had in the past, has a lot of medications for the liver and so on, okay? So I really doubt he's going to get to 86. He's, he's an alcoholic, uh, but probably the type of alcoholic that, that you won't think that he's like an alcoholic is a high functioning alcoholic. So he will just go to meetings and things like that. He will be drinking all through the day, but he's just high functioning. You know, so he can crack a joke here and he can just do, do his things. He can drive. In fact, he drives. Uh, and he's always, you know, goes to places, go to business deals, he's always drinking, always drinking. Now, and the liver is already showing signs. So I have, by genetics, a weaker liver. If I drink the amount of alcohol that my father is drinking, I won't even get to my father's age either. Okay? So there is a genetic predisposition to certain things. Imagine you've got a chain with the different, different, um, how you call the things that form the chain? The links, with the different links. Thank you. Uh, with the different links, okay? And have you seen people that all of a sudden, you know, they, they, they have an uh, unhealthy lifestyle or they even have a healthy lifestyle, but all of a sudden, boom, one of the links break in the liver or the link breaks into high blood pressure or the link breaks on the diabetes, or the link bre breaks on the colon cancer, or the brick. Have you noticed that? Like, it seems like everybody's breaking at some different point. Okay? And that is a genetical predisposition to that. If I'm going to break, most probably it will be either my pancreas or my liver, you know, from my mom's side, side diabetes, from my father's side, definitely the liver. Okay? So if I break there, if I, if I just go all crazy and I don't care about anything, sooner or later, life will catch up with me and my decisions will catch up with me and I will probably break from liver or from the pancreas, okay? Now, there is something, sometimes that is so hard to understand, especially when we're dealing, and, and I am not an expert in cancer by, by any means, but especially when we're dealing with cancer, because you find, for instance, and I was just talking to one of you um, before we started, you have a person that is consuming meat, is consuming a very, you know, a, a interesting combination lifestyle, not, not the healthy prototype, prototype of lifestyle. And that person is in his 80s and he develops colon cancer. All right, you go, all right, colon cancer, you know, is, we know the high percentage of animal, fat, animal fats and high percentage of, um, of, uh, of, of pro animal proteins and so on are linked to colon cancer risk, okay? But then you have the most amazing cases, or will appear to be amazing, you know? You have a 40 years old lady that has been a vegetarian all her life since a baby and all of a sudden, colon cancer metastasized to the liver. Let me tell you, that's not an invention. That was my friend. She died at the age of 40. She had five children. She never tasted meat in her life, never put a cigarette in her mouth, and never drank a glass of any type of alcohol. 40 years of age. Colon cancer in the sigmoid. Why in the sigmoid area? Because 80% which is actually near what we call the, pe the, the hepatic return portal. There's a group of veins there that are actually connecting that return for alkaloids uh, to, to facilitate the, the detoxification of the liver with alkaloids and they return to the liver. So she had primary colon cancer metastasized to the liver, which is actually one common thing. So you'll hear a lot the colorectal cancer metastasized to the liver because of the return veins that are, are bringing the alkaloids for the desensification of the liver. So I see her there. And you go, all right, explain that one. In your wisdom, explain that one. You know, I would say to my son, oh, how much I, will, I wish I was 16. Because if I was 16, I can explain it. If I was 21, I can explain it. 
But when life has hit you hard, and when you have gone through experiences in life, and you are gaining more age, you realize that there's so much that you don't understand. There's so much that you don't comprehend, and it's hard to understand. Okay? There is a level of genetical predisposition. And, and that is there. Okay? You are your ancestors. So the best way to be healthy is choose your parents first. <laughs> if that doesn't work, make sure that though you have genes loading your gun, that you do your best for your lifestyle not to pull the trigger. So my liver might fail, but I'm pretty sure if I drink the alcohol and if I get the, the wrong type of foods and things like that, it is definitely going to kick me. Okay? So you might have a predisposition to colorectal issues. The same as you, as a daughter of your mother, might, and if your mother had endometriosis, you might actually have a predisposition for extreme pain through your period and have endometriosis. There is a predisposition. But there's also lifestyle issues that are further contributors on that. Okay? So please, please do not claim to have the answer. This is far more complicated than you. Okay? So, remember, a dry colon won't go. So the colon needs water, proper stimulation, and exercise in order to do its work properly. Had a gentleman once, the wife told, asked me to, to go and visit them. I went to the house, and that man was like this. And he, everything was aching, he was not going to the toilet, and, and everything was aching, and he felt, he said, I'm felt feeling that I'm even shrinking, you know? And I said, how much water do you drink? He was thinking hard, thinking hard, and he goes, about a glass. I said, man, you're drinking a glass of water a day? And he goes, no, a week. <laughs> and I said, you know what happens when you put a grape in the sand? In, 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 and the sun is actually heating it. You know what happens to that grape? It becomes a sultana, right? So I said, that's what's happening to you. You're becoming a sultana. <laughs> and he was very, very dry, very, very dehydrated. We need to make sure that water is needed because when you are dehydrated, the first place that the body wants to recap water to, 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 to help you with all the functions of your body is from where? From the chime, which is the waste that is actually, so the, the, the leftover uh, food that is actually already climbing up the, 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 the large intestine. And if it's liquid, it will absorb the liquid back. So this is going to become very, very hard, like cement, like rocks, like pebbles. And it's, you're going, it's going to have more difficulty coming out. So there's something needed for stimulation of the bowel movement and to clean up your system and to help desintensification. And that is called water, and we don't actually drink enough. Thank you. I hear, yes, that, and a few people are already getting hold of their bottles. That's good, isn't it? We need sometimes reminders. There is actually an app that you can download nowadays. It gives you a sign, drink a glass of water. Okay? Um, so, we need also proper stimulation in the manner of exercise. Now, let me, let me tell you this, because though exercise is benef beneficial in all cases, it is actually imperative. You understand the word imperative? It is non-negotiable for some people. No exercise, they won't go. They're eating right, they're drinking right, they're putting fiber, they're doing everything, they're taking probiotics, they're doing absolutely everything. But in for, specifically for these people, no exercise, no movement. They won't move. And they realize that, they realize that and, and that's what they have to do. They actually have to walk. You know, my brother says that every time that, it, where, I, where I grew up, there's mountains everywhere. And uh, you leave the village, the town, and you, wherever you go, you have to climb a mountain. So my brother always goes prepared, you know, with some, Paper, extra paper, because <laughs> as you are walking up the mountain, what's happening? Stimulation. It's actually stimulation. So, you come to see me and you tell me that you've been sitting all day in the office and then you're going to sit in front of your TV all night and that you want, you want your gut to be fixed. 
and you're wondering what supplements you should do, what colon detox you should do, what probiotics you should take, what foods you should take away, and things like that. Well, one of the things that I'm going to tell you is you need to get up and start walking because it, the, the, the system needs movement and exercise and stimulation in order to work properly. Your lymphatic system needs movement in order to, re, to get rid of the toxins. You need to move. It is actually imperative. You know who doesn't move? Dead people. And uh, so exercise in order to do work properly. So proper stimulation is actually the food that you eat. Okay, the food that you eat, there's actually re uh, some receptors that the bulkiness of your food will create a much better bowel movement or a, a much better uh, stimulation of your colon to actually move. And that's why people do this fast. They do this fasting, how much stimulation are you putting in here? Nothing. How much is this moving? Nothing. So you're meant to do a detox and nothing is moving. So you're just moving it from here to here. But it's not coming out. It's like you're cleaning the bathtub, and you're cleaning the bathtub, but you never actually unplug, unplug it. So you just move the dirt from the walls, and now they're all sitting at the bottom of that bathtub with the water. You need to unplug it. Okay? So we'll talk to, to you more about that in future lectures. So we actually show you enemy alpha, which was the toilet. And we talked about the posture, the squatting posture of the toilet. Now, some people ask me, what are the measurements? Well, it depends in a number of, of situations. It, it depends on the length of your legs. So if, uh, if you look at, my, uh, um, at myself with someone else, probably from here up, I am not that short. But from here down, I am short. So I've, I've got the, what we call, a, in medical terms, short Spanish legs. Okay, short Spanish le legs. So from here to here, I I'm not that short, but it's from here down. So depending on the length of the legs, they will also depend on the height of your toilet. There's actually toilets that are very low. There's actually toilets that are higher. So you want to get something that is comfortable and something that you can actually try to get in this area here as close as you to your thighs as, as possible. So the, me the measurement, it will depend. That website that I show you, the uh, Squatty Potty, they actually have two different sizes. Okay, so check on that, and two, two different sizes. Because what we want to do is we want to evacuate as much toxins as possible because we don't want this to be called our compost bin. We want this to be efficient. And what actually happens is the following. You start having problems down here, and it's like a traffic jam. Let's say you, got, you just leave, leave your house and you enter into the freeway, okay? And everybody's entering into the freeway. Now, 30 kilometers from where you are, there has been a huge accident, and people are starting to stop there, okay? Right to the, at the end of the freeway, at the exit part of the freeway, there has been an accident, and there's a blockage, and people are stopping there. Now, you, you are 30 kilometers away from there. You're still driving. No problem, isn't it? But sooner or later, it's going to catch up with you, and you're going to be stuck there. So if this is stuck here, you're eating from here, and eventually it's going to catch up. Some of the bacteria is going to start migrating up because you're getting so much building up of bacteria here that is not being evacuated, and it starts finding other, other exits. So the exit is backtrack, and starts finding other exits, and then all of a sudden you end up with a very huge huge compost bin. Okay? You like the medical term, compost bin? Okay? Those that were here with the weight, weight seminar, you remember the, uh, the witch and the wimp. Now you're going to remember the compost bin. Okay, so now we are going to show you the enemy, public enemy beta. And it's in these lines. So the public enemy beta is two major factors of constipation. Okay? If we put diet as one of them, now there's many, there's not just two, okay? There's many. The, I'm just putting two major ones. There's more than two. But if I put diet as one, which one will you put next? Oh, we already spoke about water. Exercise, we already spoke about exercise. I'll put this one. 
No answering the call when nature rings. It's amazing. But sometimes you're speaking with somebody, you're having a very interesting conversation. The phone rings and they go, just sorry, excuse me. Yeah. And then just cut you off right there, you know? Or you are talking to them and, and you hear the ding, 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 ding. Ah, really? Yep. And they're writing a message on Twitter, answering to that one. <laughs> right? It's no problem because, because they just sound. Now, you know that Twitter has a little sound. That's Twitter. You know the, 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 the social media? Twitter. I was on a, on a traffic light once. It was so funny to see because it sounded, this, uh, this sound came up. And all of a sudden, we were waiting to cross over, you know, from that side and from this side. And the sound was, and there were like 20 people getting hold of their mobiles and you put them in out, you know, just to check. It was amazing. We just saw program to answer that one and we have forgotten there is a go to the toilet one. We ignore it. Now, it is actually understood that between girls and boys up to the age, I think it was up to the age of 12, 9 or 12, that the, uh, the boys will actually be more constipated than the girls. Think about this. This is a girl playing with a, with a doll, with a Barbie doll. You know, she's playing there. She needs to go. She leaves the Barbie doll there. She, she goes, comes back, and she keeps on playing with the Barbie doll. Now, this is a boy that needs to go and he's playing with his truck. <laughs> if he leaves the truck, man, if he leaves that truck to go to the toilet, who knows? Somebody might come and grab it. I'm not letting it out. So the boy is there, you see it, you know, like he's like, he's red as a tomato and he's not going. And then you go, come on, man, go to the toilet. And he, mm, and he grabs the truck and he goes. It's so different, isn't it? Then from the age of 13 onwards, ladies tend to actually suffer more from constipation. And a lot has to do with body image and a lot has to do with all the pressure that teenagers are having, okay? And, uh, and they're playing more with diet. They have more drastic changes in their diet that boys do. Boys won't change that much from that, that time. But girls will do, will try different things, will, will have days without eating, and then they will just eat funny, or they will change diets and things like that. And they will have an issue there, okay? But just imagine, you get up in the morning, the children need to catch the bus, you know, you, you need to go, but the bus is coming, you need to go, but the bus is coming. So you prepare the sandwiches, you put them there, come on, come on, you come outside, the bus is there, they are already both of your children are in the bus, you turn back home, huh, I don't need to go anymore. You miss the call. The call was ringing, the caller was ringing, but you actually missed the call, okay? Now, if you actually increase 30% of more ways by just changing the, um, the posture in which you actually evacuate, you can actually go from one to two times a day just by paying attention, when is your, your uh, call calling you, okay? So there's a lot of psychological things with your gut. Remember, this is like the freeway. If you have a block up exit, it's going to start affecting all the way up, okay? And we will have a section in the, in, uh, in the following program about IBS, Crohn's, and ulcerative colitis which is actually affecting higher than what people think, especially, especially uh, Crohn's, okay? Now, um, there's a lot of psychological things with this, you know. I heard of, the, of this guy that stopped going to the toilet because the, the wife did renovations in the toilet and put everything pink. And he will actually go to the petrol station. He will rather just go to the petrol station and have it in the, person, in the petrol station like a man than be in the house on a pink toilet. You know, there's... And you think, oh, like, look at this man, you know, what's his problem, you know, pink toilet, you know, he has psychological issues. Yeah, what about the women that go camping with the husband? And the husband has assured her that there are toilets there. And the first thing when she lands, they're not, about, they're not worried about 
where look at the beautiful river, look at the beautiful mountain. They're not paying attention. The husband is saying, look at this. They just on a radar. They just fierce. They just like that. And the husband is, and the husband is just saying, Well, wow, this is going to be fantastic. And she's saying, Where are the toilets? And he said, Oh, the toilets. Yep, I'll show you where they are. They, they're just behind those trees over there. I'll just come with me. You know what a pit toilet is? The pit toilet is just, it looks like a toilet. You will not dare to sit on that one. And it's just, it's, it's like a history box. The history of the last 30 years of people <laughs> passing through the toilet is there. All there. It's a history box. So you can tell that lady, you know, she's just going on a Friday, they're going to have a fishing weekend. So she goes in, have a look, close it. She won't go back for three days. She's holding on. She won't stop in a petrol station. She wants to go home. And she wants to go home for just one thing, one reason. It's psychological. Those are the, the, the moments where a posture like this you know, so, is so beneficial. Knowing to be able to hold your equilibrium in a posture like this is so beneficial. Make sure you don't find any stinging nettle around you when you're doing that in the, in the wild. But just bear in mind that not answering the call is like that guy on the freeway. I want you to notice what not answering the, in the call is that it's like that guy in the freeway. I don't know if this happens the same in here in your country, but in, in Australia, you are going on the freeway, and all of a sudden, you're going at 110, all of a sudden, 70 kilometers an hour. Everybody's pressing the brakes, 70 kilometers an hour. And just the first thing they think, is, oh, it must be an accident. And then you're going at 70 for about five Ks, and then back to 110. And you're wondering, what happened? You know, in moments like that, it's like you want to have one of those drones and send that drone five kilometers ahead and say, who is the guy that is pressing the brake there? And then everybody just, oh, must be something. So they see the red, there must be something, the boom, 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 boom. We're all at 70. That's actually what happens when we ignore the call. It's like somebody's pressing the brake. Brake. And then by that time, by the time that lady goes home, she's bloated, she's driving, she's in the, in the passenger seat, just driving like this. You know, the husband is wondering, she didn't have a good time. No, she didn't. You didn't provide a toilet for her. <laughs> she wasn't having a good time. And we ignore the answer of nature, and the answer of nature is there for a reason. If you keep on ignoring it, it's like you start forgetting that you meant to. Okay? Look at this, this guy. This guy was a funny guy. Very funny. He was always dressed in white because everybody else was dressed in black. That's how you, you that's the definition of a show off. Isn't it? Everybody's dressed in black, so you're dressed in white. But he was a very, very clever guy too. He actually, in the, in the, in the turning of the century, he, said he did a lot of operations in the turning of the century, he said the civilized colon, now when, it's, when, it's, when he's talking about the civilized colon, he's talking about 100, 100, 100 years ago, okay? So now he's more civilized. So the civilized colon is a poor cripple, made, misshapen, misshaped, uh, overstretched in parts, contracted in other parts, prolapsed, adherent, kinked, kinked infected, paralyzed, inefficient, incompetent. It is the worst abuse and, mo and the most variously damaged of any organs in the body. And that was a hundred years ago when people will work in the fields, will actually be walking to go to work, will, will actually be on horse riding, etc. A hundred years ago. I like that definition. That's why I wanted to put it in there. And he actually, in, in his book, The Itinerary of the Breakfast, he shows a, a very interesting pictures. Now, the black area at 8 a.m. On, on the left is food in the stomach. That's your breakfast. Okay? At noon, your breakfast has been uh, going through the small intestine. That's at noon. Then, at 1 p.m., you have your lunch. Can you see the lunch in the stomach? 
on the left, the lunch is on the stomach. On the right, the, uh, the breakfast is already passing through the ileocecal valve there. Okay? Now, at 5 p.m., the lightly shaded area shows the breakfast residue in the colon. The dark area shows the lunch residue ready to enter the colon. So now you have the breakfast is just moving in the trans, uh, transverse colon, and the lunch is just ready when able to enter. It's just like a highway. So at 6 p.m., the light shaded area shows the breakfast residue mostly in the descending colon. The lunch residue is passing into the colon and mixing with the breakfast residue. The dark area shows dinner just eaten and in the stomach. Okay? Now at 9 p.m., the breakfast residue is in the sigmoid colon ready to be discharged. The lunch residue is in the sigmoid and, uh, and the ascending and transverse colon. The dinner residue is ready to enter the colon. Okay? You following through? So now we're going to the 8 o'clock in the morning next day. Oh, sorry, no, 10 p.m. The breakfast residue has been discharged. Sorry, that's a night movement. Now that person has a night movement. Now bowel movement. So the breakfast residue has been discharged by our bowel movement at bedtime. The lunch residue is moving through the colon. The dinner residue is waiting to enter the colon. So, so far you had your breakfast at 8 and now you had a discharge of that breakfast at 10. How many hours have passed? About 12 hours. Okay? 6 o'clock in the morning, the dinner residue is in the descending and the sigma colon ready to be discharged. 6.30, the bowel movement has just occurred. The residue of the previous night's dinner is left in the colon. At 8 a.m., the bowel has completely evacuated and preparation for, the, for a new series of meals, breakfast, is now in the stomach. That is called entire cycle, back again to zero. There's no cars left on the side of the road. Everybody has gone through the exit. Are you following that? So, that's another scenario here. If the bowel is moved only once a day, it will contain the residue of six meals eventually. If nine or more meals are held, chronic constipation will exist. So, in other words, you are accumulating more traffic and more traffic from coming meals and coming meals, okay? So, one of the things that I recommend people to make sure that the system is nice and clean is as you, before you brush your teeth at night, you are sit in the proper position that we have explained previously in the previous lecture. You sit in that position in the toilet. Yeah, but I don't need to go. It doesn't matter. You just sit there for five minutes. And uh, the thing is that you are retraining, re-educating the habits. Some of the habits need to be re-educated. You sit there for five minutes. Nothing happened. That's all right. The next day, you sit there for five minutes. Nothing happened. That's all right. And one of these days, something is going to happen. You just all of a sudden increase your evacuation by one more time, just by sitting there in the toilet. Now, I'm going to tell you that the spelling of the word toilet is not L-I-B-R-A-R-Y. It's not the library. The library is another place. It's not the library. It's not the mobile place. That's not what it is. It's called the toilet for a reason. You're going to do business, but it's not business online. It's a different type of business, okay? Those are called pockets, the particular, okay? So you see the pockets there, there, and there, and there, and there. Now, the pockets are a result of constipation. In majority of cases, as a result of constipation. When you're dehydrated and the waste is passing through, it's actually scratching and making little foldings on your colon and making little, little inserts and little pockets in there. So what happens with those pockets? What do you think happens with those pockets? Well, according to the Merck manual, which is a manual for the doctors, it says that the particular acquired sac-like mucosal projections through the muscular layer of the colon or rectum occurs anywhere in the large bowel, but usually in the sigmoid and rarely below the rectum. 
very, very in diameter, most in particular are multiple, they are uncommon in persons younger than 40, but increase rapidly then after that, so that eventually every person will have many. Are you under 40? Congratulations. Are you over 40? Hmm. According to the manual for the doctors, men, there will be many people that will have many of these pockets. So, so what? Everybody has it. That's normal, isn't it? If many people will have it, that makes it normal or that makes it common? It makes it common. It doesn't make it normal. So, I wonder, what would be a proper uh, protocol or some of the things that a proper protocol should include for the particular? And I remember once I had two friends, that both of them doctors, husband and wife, and uh, when I mentioned that, you know, some, some fiber from, from vegetables, for instance, should be included, they said to me, ah, oh, that's, that's not what we do. And I said, oh, so what do you do? They said, well, we normally just tell them just to take it, take it easy, you know, white potato, white rice, white bread, just take it easy. And they said, oh, well, why is that? They said, because if you give them fiber, you know, it stirs up things. And they start feeling, you know, stirs up things and gas and things like that. And, and that, to a degree, that's true, because there's actually an, a way that you need to do it, okay? There's actually a process, because there's a lot of bacteria and imbalance and so on. But these two doctors, husband and wife, they were actually telling me that. And I said, oh, that's interesting, because obviously, as a doctor, you, you, you follow the Merck manual and say, well, the, the Merck manual is there as a reference, yes. So according to the Merck manual, these bowel pockets leak pass blood and fecal matter back into the bloodstream. So in those pockets, you actually have fecal matter, pass, and blood. And you got blood vessels all around your body, or oh, sorry, all around your colon, that are actually meant to absorb certain things, definitely not pass and blood and fecal matter. And that goes back into the system. And it goes back into the system, eventually it will go through the filtering system of the liver. Can you imagine the frustration of the liver? The liver do you know that the liver gets frustrated? You know, that's toxin A. Metabolizes toxin A, sends it out through the bile into the, into the uh, uh, gastrointestinal uh, canal, down, down the way, off you go. A few hours or a few hours later, it comes again. What are you doing here? I send you out. Well, they send me up. I said, well, send them back again. And then it comes up again, and all the way. Exhibit A is coming up and up and up and up again. Why? Because we have a lot of pockets that are just little compost beans alongside. You know one of the things that you get with compost, compost beans? You get nice worms there. Oui. Okay, so the treatment according to the Meg manual, a bland diet is not indicated for persons with diverticulosis. For normal colonic functions, the, the, the diet should include a sufficient intake of fluids and roughage from whole wheat, bread, bran, cereal, fruits, and vegetables. Now, that's where the Merck manual is saying, I will have an issue with some of the, of the wheat, and if you, know, if you wanna know more about it, please watch the Gluten Connection seminars that, that are also available, okay? But the Merck manual does recommend some uh, type of fluids and and fiber. Now, they more recommending the unsoluble fiber. We're actually more towards the soluble fiber. So the soluble fiber are the ones that you probably find more in fruit and, fruit and vegetables rather than just in a lot of roughage from the grain, okay? Which can actually can create a lot of disturbances. But it's interesting because my two friends, the doctors, they were actually giving to people with diverticulosis. They were giving them bland diet because otherwise you stir up things when in their manual actually says, do not give them a bland diet. Toxemia is a condition in which, in which the, uh, the blood contains poisonous products which are produced by the growth of pathogenic or disease-producing bacteria. Pimples, for example, are usually the first indication that toxemia has found its way into the body. Now, not all pimples 
I, I should say, but for instance, what are the things that what, what, what are one of the things that teenagers have? Pimples. Now, what do they have? Toxemia. Well, you better believe it because they actually have no toxemia to the stream, but they do have more toxicity forming because they have all these changes in hormones, and many of those hormones get metabolized by the liver, and they produce a lot of toxins, and they actually spell out through the skin. Okay, and then they, they scratch it and they put bacteria in it and it gets infected, and etc. So the toxemia can be a, it's, it's an accumulation of toxins when bacteria through, through, through ba pathogenic bacteria that can actually tax the body, tax your liver, etc. And why is it actually deciding to go through your skin in this case, for instance? Because all the areas like the colon might be stuck. Okay, and the toxemia, toxemia can be generated by those, those pockets, for instance, but it can be generated by that bacteria higher up now, moving up a little bit from the, from the uh, large intestine into the small intestine. When bacteria is eating your food and is excreting, excreting your food and is throwing toxins because of it, and rather than you absorbing your food, you are actually absorbing the toxins from that bacteria into your system, okay? Oy, look at that one. That is a leg ulcer, okay? That's a leg ulcer. Now, there's a number of reasons for leg ulcers. We need to make sure that, that the person's circulation is proper, that there is not a, an issue with diabetes there that can influence the, um, the digestion, oh, sorry, the digestion, the, the, the return of the blood. Um, that the person's weight is not a contributor, that the person's sedentary, sedentary uh, position through the day is not actually a contributor. There's another, a, a number of reasons. But if besides all those reasons, that person is not evacuating poisons or toxins or the waste properly, the body has to find ways of spelling it out. Okay? So though we cannot pinpoint it to one particular instance, what we can say though is that there is a number of contributors. I mean, if you have diabetes condition or pre-diabetes condition, it's going to be an influence on your, on your blood return. If you have bad circulation in that area, if you actually have extra weight, if you are actually uh, spend a lot of time sitting and you get swelling of uh, a fluid retention in that area, it's going to be a number of issues. But one of them is if you have a lot of toxicity being generated by bacteria here in the upper part of your digestive system, such as the uh, small intestine, or if you have a lot of accumulated compost being in your, in your colon, and that toxicity is being re, retaken in and retaken in and retaken in, you got two options. Either you end up with that, or you die. Because the, the body is going to prioritize and it's going to go, well, what is the worst of two evils? The one that will kill you or the one that will just make you sick. And the body says, well, choose the one that will make you sick rather than the one that will kill you. The body also prioritizes. Okay? Now that is called a polyp. Okay? Can you see that? So polyps that size, they got about 10% chance of become cancerous. They like a little wart in there. And when you, if you get a colonoscopy done, they, as they go in, if they find any polyp, they will probably take it out, take it out, take it out as they go in, and they'll probably have a biopsy on it, and they'll have a sample on it, okay? Now, when you have constip constipation, for instance, and that th thing is not moving very, very quickly at all, the, the, the waste is not moving quickly, and you got that thing standing up there, like a traffic light in the freeway, in the middle of the freeway, you know, all the avalanche of waste is going to just be continuously irritating it, continuously rubbing it, continuously making a, a pain on it, right? Do you think that will increase the chances to, to upset that fella? You don't want to upset that fella because it can change nature. Do you understand what I mean by change nature? Okay, so polyps are actually very common in people, okay? And there's actually... The, the, the studies in which they, they're trying to work out why there's, a, that there's actually definitely a, a genetic disposition. Your father had polyps, your grandfather had polyps. If you don't look after yourself or even looking after yourself, you might actually have polyps, okay? But of course, if you have a compost being there, do you think that will upset that polyp? 
So you want to make sure that there's, there's, there's not upsetting them. Okay, we don't, we don't upset in these, these fellows here. Look at this one. The pain of hemorrhoids. Now, will you, let's say that's the way of escape, and every time that you are going to escape to that door, there's a, if you stay here, now you can't go home. But if you go through that door, the door is open, but if you go through the door, there's a guy there with a baseball bat, and he's going to hit you hit you on your arm or your leg nice and hard. It won't kill you, though. It's not going to kill you. It's just going to hit you hard, but it won't kill you. So you'll end up sore. Would you actually be at least thinking, considering a little bit when will be the best time to go? Okay, when you got these fellas here, painful hemorrhoids, you will actually be considering when to go because it's going to be painful. So your psychological solution becomes a bigger problem because now you're getting accumulation and accumulation of more and more and more things there. Okay? I, I was sharing, sharing a, a little homemade, it's not a remedy, it's just a, a, something to alleviate this, these things, you know? And I, I, needed a, I needed a knife, so I asked for a knife, and I said, this is just something that can help you initially, you need to do a lot of things to, to try to correct this situation, but something that can initially help you with this, and I asked for a knife. So obviously everybody, somebody gave me a knife, and everybody started looking very suspicious about it. And I think I said to them, you know, I'm not planning to cut, cut your, he your hemorrhoids, by the way. So then I asked for a potato. And I just got a small potato, and I started just carving on that potato until that potato looked like a mushroom. So you got the head of the mushroom and the, the stem of, the, of that mushroom, but carved into a potato. And then I said, what you do is you, you need, for the process, you need a nice video, a good documentary, something that is going to enrich your mind. You know, don't get any Hollywood stuff that you know, is going to terrify your dreams. You know, just something that you're going to learn something positive about, right? Make sure it's about, about two hours, good documentary, you know, about the work of engineering in the world and things like that, you know? Something fascinating. Uh, so it has to be about two hour video. And somebody raised their hand and said, is the video necessary? He said, yeah, the video is part of the, pro uh, of the protocol. For hemorrhoids, yep, yeah, that video. Alternatively, get a nice book, not a fiction book that talks about, you know, breaking hearts of, of uh, no, no, just something that you're going to learn something about, you know, a good testimony or something like that. Is the book necessary? Yep, it's necessary. Make sure you read for two hours. Alternatively, if you're good at knitting, make sure you're good at knitting for three hours, or for two hours, sorry. So what you actually do is you need olive oil. <coughs> you need to lubricate the area, which is the area, the area where the hemorrhoid is there. You lubricate the area with the oil. You lubricate the tip of that mushroom made out of a potato. And you actually introduce that stem of the mushroom into the area. Which area? Well, the area that you know what the area is. Don't ask me about the area. That's the area. You introduce the potato into that area. And that's, the, and that's when the part of the video comes in. That's the part of the book or the knitting comes in. Now you sit carefully and comfortably, OK? And then you just watch the video for two hours, or you just do knitting for two hours, and so on. That is actually called a hemorrhoid potato poultice. Okay? Now, it's not going to be the final solution, but it's going to actually alleviate the inflammation. Okay? It's going to alleviate the inflammation. If you had, if you are a woman and you had a very difficult delivery, you probably have some of these fellas here. Okay, and maybe they came in again, so you want to make sure that they don't come out again. And what is a mimicking of a delivery? A constipation person, a person that is constipated. It's just mimicking delivery of a baby. So those, those uh, hemorrhoids that came into the picture when you delivered your baby, they might come back again if you are actually suffering from constipation, okay? So that is a, actually a very 
short um, thing that you can do. Don't forget your book, don't forget your video, the video. Okay, it's important. But this is very, very extremely, extremely common. They can bleed. If you see blood, you want to make sure that they are hemorrhoids. You want to make sure that they are not any other thing. You want to make sure that they are not the polyps that are bleeding or something else. You should actually be evacuating and don't feel that you got something there wanting to come out and then there's nothing coming out. If that's your feeling and you've been, if you've been feeling uncomfortable about that feeling, you might like to check that out. Because if you got a growth there that is kind of moving and rubbing, it's giving you the sensation that there's still some waste there. But that waste is not a waste. I mean, that waste is actually a touch. It's a growth. Okay? So you want to make sure that if you start feeling that, that type of thing or bleed, blood, blood is coming out, that you want to check it further. Okay? So blood can actually be through hemorrhoids. And I've got, some, I've got patients, you know, they come and they're all hysterical or they were hysterical and then they checked it, they, they checked it at the hospital or the doctor because they thought that they were, they were bleeding. And what happened was that they were just hemorrhoids. Okay? But bear, bear in mind, blood coming out is not a good thing regardless, okay? So, some nutritional sins, uh, the inadequate uh, consumption of fiber. Now, when you actually go and you get whole grains as your main source of fiber, what those whole grains are actually doing is the scratching the, in in the interior part of your epithelial cells. They're scratching them. And this in, in to a degree, the people are putting far too much fiber coming from cereals. And they, from cereals, and they say, uh, if I don't actually eat that, I won't go. And what about if you eat them? Oh, I'll go straight away. Now think about that. I'll go straight away. Why? Because they have become irritant, and your body is trying to get rid of them. So we can't use fiber to a point in which, or the type of fiber to the point in which is actually making us go because it's irritant. I've got people that they say, oh, I just go, it is very, very loose, but I just go. It shouldn't be that loose. Why is it going that loose? Because of the fiber. Which fiber? The wrong type of fiber. Mainly, a lot of roughage, a lot of the, the extras that we put in the whole grains, we put these additions, fibers, and we have this Rabbit food. Have you seen those rabbit foods? You, know, in, you get it in muesli and things like that. Rabbit food. And, uh, you know, additional one. Additional, uh, f um, because the people are so constipated that all of a sudden, no, I go. And they just go very, very rapidly. And that is not because they're having a proper bowel movement. That's because the body wants to get rid of it. It's irritating. And it wants to get rid of it. And it creates inflammation. And then the person goes, but it's inflamed. It's bloated. And there's many people that say, well, I eat that, it bloats me, but it, gets, it helps me going. Or well, it's, like, it's like a smoker and a coffee drinker saying, I know it's, this is not good for me, but I'm going, I need to smoke and I need to drink coffee in order to do what? To go to the toilet. Why? Because the smoke and the coffee is irritant of the rectum and it makes them go. There's actually better ways. Okay? So, some recommendations are linseed, psyllium husk, uh, slippery elm, now, psyllium husk and slippery elm, they're not actually roughage. They're actually soluble fibers. They are bulkers. They bulk up. They absorb water and they bulk up. Now, I put fresh fruits and, and fresh vegetables way above whole grains. Whole grains should actually be, in terms of your fiber, way down there. And the fresh fruits and vegetables should be way above. Soluble fibers are what we're aiming for, rather than unsoluble fibers, which are found in roughage, in the grains. They, they, many people are irritant. The people go, yes, go, but because of out of irritation of the bowel, not out of proper, con, uh, out of proper bowel movement. Okay? The inadequate consumption of fiber, as we say, consumption of too much fat and the wrong kinds of fats. So excessive consumption, for instance, of pasteurized, homogenized dairy products. You get people, you take them out of milk, and all of a sudden they go. They get the milk, and they, go, they won't go. What's the problem? So they don't take the milk, they go perfect. They get the milk, they don't go. They're not dealing with this. 
there's very, very few people that can actually digest milk. And I am not one of them. If I drink milk just like that, pasteurized amandinized milk, if I drink it, I'll probably going to have a little bit of an episode. I'm going to go. And there are people that go because of that, or they just, or they won't go, or they will just go very, very, very watery. Now, that's not because what this is doing to the colon, is but what this is doing to the small intestine. It's creating a toxicity there. The lactose most probably is feeding the wrong type of bacteria. That wrong type of bacteria is actually excreting out toxins. That toxin is irritant. The body wants to get rid of the toxin, so it actually generates a lot of water, flushes a lot of water into that area, so you can actually have a very watery bowel movement. You get rid of, you're getting rid of it. So excessive consumption of inorganic salt, excessive consumption of sugar. Now, sugar is a disaccharide. It's a disaccharide. Lactose is a disaccharide. So sugar as a disaccharide, lactose as a disaccharide, they will feed a wrong type of bacteria. The friendly bacteria in the right place in the right amount, but not friendly at all in the wrong type, in the wrong area. And this is actually feeding, and this is one of the biggest poisons in the world. Okay? Sugar is one of the biggest poisons. It's doing so much harm. You know, we, I'm, I'm not telling you not to get sugar. You know, just take sugar once in a blue moon. When was the last time that you saw a blue moon? <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> but the problem is that we don't actually realize that if we get through the average individual, the amount of sugar or anything that can be down, downsized to sugar molecules is just unbelievable. From the breakfast cereals in the morning, these saccharides there on oligosaccharides, to the lactose on the milk, these saccharides, from a little bit of the, of the maple syrup, these saccharides, to the, to the sandwich with a little bit of, of yogurt with fruit and thing, with that fruity, fruity yogurt, these saccharides, sugar. You start checking the entire day, they're full of sugar. The majority of the things, they're full of sugar. You're only feeding one type of bacteria. Excessive consumption of wheat. Watch the, wheat, the, the, the gluten connection for that one. Now, anybody has heard of this one? This is actually an Australian brand. Okay. Swedish bitters. Have you heard of Swedish bitters? Okay. Now, again, this is not a solution. It is not a solution. So you got two versions of Swedish bitters. You actually have an alcohol-infused version, and you have a glyceride version. Okay? So one has alcohol, the other one doesn't. I can assure you right now, you won't get drunk on that thing. That thing is called bitters for something. That thing is bitter. Okay? So where do I use Swedish bitters? Okay. One example. I go to Spain. I see my mom every five years as an average. Lately, I've been seeing her more. But uh, as an average, five years. I go there. Now, for a mother, if you, if you only had sons, like the, in the case of my mom, you know, when, when those sons get married, they get married with another woman, if you know what I mean. It's the other woman. The other woman is going to do the cooking for my son. And the other woman is going to look after my son and so on. So there's very few little things that are left to my mom to still be a mom. She's in Spain. I'm in Australia. So every, every birthday, I receive a packet, you know, with a shirt and new underwear for the entire year. <laughs> so my underwear is my mom's underwear. You know, I cannot take that away from her. You know, it's like it makes her feel mom still. So, so she sends me the underwear. And then when I go there, she cooks for me. She actually moves upside. Now, when I actually told her, because I'm a vegetarian, I don't know if I mentioned, but I am a vegetarian. When, years ago, uh, when I told her that I was a vegetarian, you know, it, it was so confusing for her. You know? So uh, to make it easy, I said to her, OK, just use the Spanish cooking without, without any of the meat. And he goes, OK, I can do that. So the first thing that she thought was Spanish omelet. Now, Spanish omelet is, now, the way mum mum makes it, which is very, very yummy, is potato, eggs, onion, and lots, lots of olive oil. Lots. 
Okay? So, I don't normally eat that. In, that. in that ratio, in some of the ingredients, I don't normally eat it. But at the same time, I should say, I won't apologize to anybody for what I'm going to say because it's my mom. Okay? So, and she's making the best. She actually, when she knows I'm coming, she goes to some of the local farmers that have chooks and it buys very expensive eggs just because, you know, my son, the one from Australia, he's coming. So she gets like a dozen, right? And then she makes this, she, fr she fries these potatoes in a lot of olive oil, lots. So they, and when she gets all the eggs and the onion there, and when she puts the egg, the, the, uh, the potatoes and the onion in the eggs just to make the mixture, just to give it that extra mum flavor, you know, she, she transfers some of that oil also to that. Okay, so she makes it and she lets it there, macerating there for a bit, and then she makes the omelet, a 12 egg omelet, a huge thing. There's an art of making omelets in Spain, okay? So, imagine I'm there, I haven't seen my mom for five years. And I've been looking after my body, I've been looking after, make sure, you know, nothing gets heavy here and so on. So, I go to the table, and you start noticing that something is, is not going to the plan when you only see that there is one plate, one fork, one knife, and a big omelet right in front of you. Now, she lives by herself. Friends, there are not two plates there. There's only one. My mom sits on the opposite side of the table, like this. <laughs> you know what she's thinking? My little boy is home, and I'm going to cook for him what he loves the most. Friends, I am of the conviction that at that point, I just give things, and I, that thing is going to do so much good to my body, you know? I enjoy it. It takes me back to my childhood. I enjoy it. My mom has gone out of the way for me. I will go out of my way for her. No questions asked, no apologies to absolutely anybody. And I'll eat, and I eat as much as I can, you know, because she's there, she, she's there, she's looking. She goes, sirvete mas, sirvete mas. No? Serve yourself more. <laughs> okay. I think I'm getting too much. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> All right. If you've ever been to Spain, you know, when, if you know that you are going to only have two scoops of a casserole, tell the person that is about to serve you that you only want one. That way you, get, you might get the two, maximum three. Because if you don't say anything, they'll just keep on going, okay? So it comes a point in which sort of I really definitely had enough. And I just stand up, she stands up. Man, the smile of my mom's face is worth millions. Worth millions. So I just go to my mom, I give her a hug, and I say, you're the best Spanish omelet cook in the world. You know, that thing is so heavy. <laughs> it just not, wasn't just the oil and everything, but just, you know, she was just shoveling it in my, you know, so heavy. Woo, and that's when you're, when these kind of belts are very handy, you know, because you can move it and nobody realized that you actually put a, a, a different hole. You know, these are great. Men, get, get hold of this type of belts. Because you see many, many, many men, you know, that it used to be this thing, and now they are this fat, and everybody can see it, mate. Everybody can see that you put on five kilos. The, the belt is telling it, use these ones. Nobody will put the finger at you, and you've been putting them on kilos, right? So then what I do, I go to the bathroom, and I get a little bottle of Swedish bitters, <laughs> and I just get a little glass, and I put 10 mils of Swedish bitters with a little bit of water, Mm. And that helps with the digestion. It's a win-win situation. Okay? In that. Now, this is not for you to all of a sudden do whatever you want to do as long as I got the sweetest bitters, you know, so wherever you go, I know that that's not good for me and I don't have 
pressure or I don't feel that I need to, but I want to, as long as I got the sweetest bitters, you know, so you are eating and <laughs> sweetest bitters here and there. That's not for that. But I'm just sharing this with you because to me it has been a lifesaver to actually be able to show uh, a good, be, being a, a proper, uh, a, a person with good education in someone else's house and be gentle and merciful to people that are moving out of their way for me has been a lifesaver. So it, it might not be that brand, the one that you will have in your country. This is an Australian brand. But Swedish bitter, bitters is going to actually help with your digestion in things like that. However, if you think the Swedish bitters is going to solve your problems, uh, it's not the answer. Neither was that potato mushroom the answer. Okay, These are going to be just some helpers on the way. So with that, we are looking forward to continue with the fourth presentation of the uh, Gut Connection, and I am delighted to have you here. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah.